Chapter Twenty Eight of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter Twenty Eight Lucilla's Ship. As soon as Dickory had left off his cocked hat, and his gold-embroidered coat. The little girl Lena had ceased to be afraid of him, and the next morning she came to him, seated lonely, for this was a busy household, and asked him if he would like to take a walk. So, hand in hand, they wandered away. Presently they entered a path which led through the woods. "'This is the way my sister goes to her lookout tree,' said the little girl, "'Would you like to see that tree?' "'Oh, yes,' said Dickory. "'And he spoke the truth. "'She goes up to the very top,' said Lena, "'to look for ships. "'I would never do that. "'I'd rather never see a ship "'than to climb to the top of such a tree. "'I'll show it to you in a minute. "'We're almost there.' "'At a little distance from the rest of the forest, "'and upon a bluff which overlooked "'a stretch of low land, "'and below that the bay,' stood a tall tree with spreading branches and heavy foliage. "'Up in the top of that is where she sits,' said the girl, "'and spies out for ships. "'That's what she's doing now. "'Don't you see her up there?' "'Your sister in the tree!' exclaimed Dickory, "'and his first impulse was to retire, "'for it had been made quite plain to him "'that he was not expected to present himself "'to the young lady of the house.' should she be on the ground or in the air. But he did not retire. A voice came to him from the treetop, and as he looked upward, he saw the same bright face which had greeted him over the top of the bushes. Below it was a great bunch of heavy leaves. "'So you've come to call on me, have you?' said the lady in the tree. "'I am glad to see you, but I'm sorry that I cannot ask you to come upstairs.' I am not receiving. He could not come up if he wanted to, said Lena. He couldn't climb a tree like that. And he doesn't want to, cried the nymph of the bay tree. I have been up here all morning, said she, looking for ships, but not one have I seen. Isn't that a tiresome occupation, said Dickory. Not altogether, she said. The branches up here make a very nice seat and I nearly always bring a book with me. You will wonder how we get books, but we had a few with us when we were marooned, and since that my father has always asked for books when he has an opportunity of trading off his hides. But I have read them all over and over again, and if it were not for the ships which I expect to come here and anchor, I am afraid I should grow melancholy." "'What sort of ships do you look for?' asked Dickory, who was gazing upward with so much interest that he felt a little pain in the back of his neck, and who could not help thinking of a framed engraving which hung in his mother's little parlour, and which represented some angels composed of nothing but heads and wings. He saw no wings under the head of the charming young creature in the tree, but there was no reason which he could perceive why she should not be an angel marooned upon a West Indian island. "'There are a great many of them,' said she, "'and they're all alike in one way. They never come. But there's one of them in particular which I look for, and look for, and look for, and which I believe that some day I shall really see. I have thought about that ship so often and I have dreamed about it so often that I almost know it must come. "'Is it an English ship?' asked Dickory, speaking with some effort, for he found that the girl's voice came down much more readily than his went up. "'I don't know,' said she, "'but I suppose it must be, for otherwise I should not understand what the people on board should say to me. It is a large ship, strong and able to defend itself against any pirates. It is laden with all sorts of useful and valuable things, 
and among these are a great many trunks and boxes filled with different kinds of clothes. Also, there's a great deal of money kept in a box by itself, and is in charge of an agent who is bringing it out to my father, supposing him to be now settled in Barbados. This money is generally a legacy for my father from a distant relative who has recently died. On this ship, there are so many delightful things that I cannot even begin to mention them. And where is it going to? asked Dickory. That I don't know exactly. Sometimes I think that it is going to the island of Barbados, where we originally intended to settle. But then I imagine that there is some pleasanter place than Barbados, and if that's the case, the ship is going there. There can be no pleasanter place than Barbados, cried Dickory. I come from that island, where I was born. There is no land more lovely in all the West Indies. You come from Barbados, cried the girl, and it really is a pleasant island? Most truly it is, said he, and the great dream of my life is to get back there. Then he stopped. Was it really the dream of his life to get back there? That would depend on several things. If, then, you tell me the truth, my ship is bound for Barbados. And if she should go, would you like to go there with us? Dickory hesitated. Not directly, said he. I would first touch at Jamaica. For some moments there was no answer from the treetop. And then came the question. Is it a girl who lives there? Yes said Dickory unguardedly. But also I have a mother in Jamaica. Indeed, said she, a mother. Well, we might stop there and take the mother with us to Barbados. Would the girl want to go too? Dickory bent his head. Alas, said he, I do not know. Then spoke the little Lena. I would not bother about any particular place to go to, said she. I'd be so glad to go anywhere that isn't here. But it is not a real ship, you know. I don't think I will take you, called down Lucilla. I don't want too many passengers, especially women I don't know. But I often think that there will be a gentleman passenger, one who really wants to go to Barbados and nowhere else. Sometimes he is one kind of a gentleman and sometimes another but he is never a soldier or a sailor, but rather one who loves to stay at home. And now, sir, I think I must take my glass and try to pick out a ship from among the spots on the far distant waves. Come on, said Lena. Do you like to fish? Because if you do, I can take you to a good place. The rest of the day Dickory spent with Mr. Mander and his wife, who were intelligent and pleasant people. They talked of their travels, their misfortunes, and their blessings, and Dickory yearned to pour out his soul to them, but he could not do so. His woes did not belong to himself alone. They were not for the ears of strangers. He made up his mind what he would do. Until the morrow, he would stay as a visitor with these most hospitable people. Then he would ask for work. He would collect firewood. He would hunt, he would fish, he would do anything, and here he would support himself until there came some merchant ship bound southward which would carry him away. If the Mander family were any way embarrassed or annoyed by his presence here, he would make a camp at a little distance and live there by himself. Perhaps the Lady of the Tree would kindly send him word if the ship he was looking for should come. It was about the middle of the afternoon, and Lena had dropped asleep beneath the tree where Dickory and her parents were conversing, when suddenly there rushed upon the little group a most surprising figure. At the first flash of thought Dickory supposed that a boy from the skies had dropped among them, but in an instant he recognized the face he had seen above the bushes. It was Lucilla, the daughter of the house. Upon her head was a little straw hat, and she wore a loose tunic and a pair of sailor's trousers, 
which had been cut off and were short enough to show that her feet and ankles were bare. Around her waist she had a belt of skins, from which dangled a string of crimson sea-beans. Her eyes were wide open, her face was pale, and she was trembling with excitement. "'What do you think?' she cried, not caring who was there or who might look at her. "'There's a ship at the spring, and there's a boat rowing across the bay, a boat with four men in it.' All started to their feet. "'A boat,' cried Mander, "'with four men in it. "'Run, my dear, to the cave. "'Press into its depths as far as you can. "'There is nothing there to be afraid of, "'and no matter how frightened you are, "'press into its most distant depths. "'You, sir, will remain with me, "'or would you rather escape? "'If it is a pirate ship, "'it may be Blackbeard who has returned.' "'Not so,' cried Lucilla. "'It is a merchant vessel, "'and they are making straight for the mouth of our stream.' "'I will stay here with you,' said Dickory, "'and stand by you, "'unless I may help your family seek the cave you speak of.' "'No, no,' said Mander. "'They don't need you. "'And if you will do so, "'we will go down to the beach and meet these men.' "'That will be better than to have them search for us. "'They will know that people live here, "'for my canoe is drawn up on the beach.' "'Is this safe?' cried Dickory. "'Would it not be better for you to go with your family "'and hide with them? "'I will meet the men in the boat.' "'No, no,' said Mander. "'If their vessel is no pirate, I do not fear them, "'but I will not have them here.' "'Now, after Mander had embraced his family,' They hurried away in tears, the girl Lucilla casting not one glance at Dickory. Impressed by the impulse that it was the proper thing to do, Dickory put on his coat and waistcoat, and clapped upon his head his high-cocked hat. Then he rapidly followed Mander to the beach, which they reached before the boat touched the sand. When the man in the stern of the boat which was now almost within hailing distance, saw the two figures run upon the beach. He spoke to the oarsmen, and they all stopped and looked around. The stop was occasioned by the sight of Dickory and his uniform, and this, under the circumstances, was enough to stop any boat's crew. Then they fell to again and pulled ashore. When the boat was beached, one of its occupants, a roughly dressed man, sprang ashore and walked cautiously towards Mander. Then he gave a great shout. "'Hi ho! Hi ho!' he cried. "'And Mander, this is you!' Then there was great handshaking and many words. "'Excuse me, sir,' said the man, raising his hat to Dickory. "'It is now more than two years since I have seen my friend here, when he was marooned by pirates.' We were all on the same merchant man, but the pirate took me along, being short of hands. I got away at last, sir, all the time addressing Dickory instead of Mander, this being respect to his rank. And shipping on board that brig, sir, I begged it of the captain that he would drop anchor here and take in water, although I cannot say it was needed and give me a chance to land and see if my old friend be yet alive. I knew the spot, having well noted it when Mander and his family were marooned. And this is Lucilla's ship, said Dickory to himself. But to the sailor he said, This is a great day for your friend and his family, but you must not lift your hat to me, for I am no officer. For a long time, at least it seemed so to Dickory, who wanted to run to the cave and tell the good news. They all stood together on the sands and talked and shook hands and laughed and were truly thankful, the men who had come in the boat as much so as those who were found on the island. It was agreed, and there was no discussion on this point, that the Mander family should be carried away in the brig, which was an English vessel bound for Jamaica 
but the happy mander could not ask any of the boat's crew to visit him at his home. Instead, he besought them to return to their vessel and bring some clothes for women, if any should be included in her cargo. "'My family,' said he, "'are not in fit condition to venture themselves among well-clad people. They are, indeed, more like savages than am I myself.' "'I doubt,' said Mander's friend, "'if the ship carries goods of that description. "'But perhaps the captain might let you have a bale of cotton cloth, "'although I suppose—' "'And here he looked a little embarrassed. "'Oh, we can buy it,' cried Dickory, "'taking some pieces of gold from his pocket, "'being coin with which Blackbeard had furnished him, "'swearing that his first lieutenant— could not feel like a true officer without money in his pocket. Take this and fetch the cloth if nothing better can be had. Thank you, cried Mander. My wife and daughters can so fashion it into shape. And, added Dickory, reflecting a little and remembering the general hues of Lucilla's face, if there be choice in colors, let the cloth be pink. When Mander and Dickory reached the house, they did not stop, but hurried on to the caves, both of them together, for each thought only of the great joy they were taking with them. "'Come out, come out!' shouted Mander as he ran, and before they reached the cave its shuddering inmates had hurried into the light. When the cries and the tears and the embraces were over— Lucilla first looked at Dickory. She started, her face flushed, and she was about to draw back. Then she stopped, and advancing held out her hand. "'It cannot be helped,' she said. "'Anyway, you have seen me before, and I suppose it doesn't matter. I'm a sailor boy, and have to own up to it. I did hope you would think of me as a young lady.' "'but we are all so happy now that that doesn't matter. "'Oh, father,' she cried, "'it can't be. "'We are not fit to be saved. "'We must perish here in our wretched rags.' "'Not so,' cried Dickory, with a bow. "'I've already bought you a gown, and I hope it is pink.' "'As they all hurried away, "'the tale of the hoped-for clothes was told.' and although Mrs. Mander wondered how gowns were to be made while a merchant man waited, she said nothing of her doubts, and they all ran gleefully. Lucilla and Dickory, being the fleetest, led the others, and Dickory said, "'Now that I have seen you thus, I shall be almost sorry if that ship can furnish you with common clothes. What you wear becomes you so.' "'Oh, ho!' cried Lucilla. "'That's fine flattery, sir. "'But I am glad you said it, "'for that speech has made me feel more like a woman "'than I have felt since I first put on this sailor's toggery.' "'In the afternoon the boat returned, "'Mander and Dickory watching on the beach. "'When it grounded, David's, Mander's friend, "'jumped on shore, "'bearing in his arms a pile of great coarse sacks.' These he threw upon the sand, and, handing to Dickory the gold pieces he had given him, said, "'The captain sends word that he has no time to look over any goods to give or to sell, but he sends these sacks, out of which the women can fashion themselves gowns, and so come aboard. Then the ship can be searched for stuffs which will suit their purposes, and which they can make at their leisure.' It was towards the close of the afternoon that all of the Mander family and Dickory came down to the boat, which was waiting for them. "'Do you know,' said Dickory, as he and Lucilla stood together on the sand, "'that in that gown of grey, with the white sleeves, and the red cord around your waist, you please me better than even you did when you wore your sailor garb.' "'And what matters it, sir, whether I please you or not?' End of chapter 28 Recording 
by Meg Turosek. Chapter Twenty Nine of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turosek. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter Twenty Nine. Captain Ichabod. Kate Bonnet was indeed in a sad case. She had sailed from Kingston with high hopes and a gay heart, and before she left she had written to Master Martin Newcombe to express her joy that her father had given up his unlawful calling, and to say how she was going to sail after him, fold him in her forgiving arms, and bring him back to Jamaica, where she and her uncle would see to it that his past sins were forgiven on account of his irresponsible mind, and where for the rest of his life he would tread the paths of peace and probity in this letter she had not yielded to the earnest entreaty which was really the object and soul of master newcombe's epistle many kind things she said to so kind a friend but to his offer to make her the queen of his life she made no answer she knew she was his very queen but she would not yet consent to be invested with the royal robes and with the crown. And when she had reached Belize, how proudly happy she had been! She had seen her father, no longer an outlaw, honest though in mean condition, earning his bread by honorable labor. Then, with a still greater pride, she had seen him clad as a noble gentleman, and bearing himself with dignity and high complacence. What a figure he would have made among the fine folks who were her uncle's friends in Kingston and in Spanish town. But all this was over now. With his own hand he had told her that once again she was a pirate's daughter. She went below to her cabin, where, with wet cheeks, Dame Charter attended her. Mr. Delaplaine was angry, intensely angry, such a shameful, wicked trick had never before been played upon a loving daughter. There were no words in which to express his most justifiable wrath. Again he went to the town to learn more, but there was nothing more to learn except that some people said they had reason to believe that Bonnet had gone to follow Blackbeard. From things they had heard they supposed that the vessel— which had sailed away in the night, had gone to offer herself as consort to the revenge, to rob and burn in the company of that notorious ship. There was no satisfaction in this news for the heart of the good merchant, and when he returned to the brig and sought his niece's cabin, he had no words with which to cheer her. All he could do was to tell her the little he had learned and to listen to her supplications. "'Oh, uncle!' she exclaimed. "'We must follow him. "'We must take him. "'We must hold him. "'I care not where he is, "'even if it be in the company of the dreadful Blackbeard. "'We must take him. "'We must hold him. "'And this time we must carry him away, "'no matter whether he will or not. "'I believe there must be some spark of feeling, "'even in the heart of a bloody pirate.' which will make him understand a daughter's love for her father. And he will let me have mine. Oh, uncle, we were very wrong. When he was here with us, we should have taken him then. We should have shut him up. We should have sailed with him to Kingston. All this was very depressing to the soul of Kate's loving uncle. For how is he to sail after her father, and take him, and hold him, and carry him away? He went away to talk to the captain of the Belinda, but that tall seaman shook his head. His vessel was not ready yet to sail, being much delayed by the flight of Bonnet, and, moreover, he vowed that, although he was as bold a seaman as any, he would never consent to set out upon such an errand as the following of Blackbeard. It was terrifying enough to be in the same bay with him, even though he were engaged in business with the pirate. 
for no one knew what strange freak might at any time suggest itself to the soul of that most bloody roisterer. But as to following him, it was like walking into an alligator's jaws. He would take his passengers back to Kingston, but he could not sail upon any wild cruises, nor could he leave Belize immediately. But Kate took no notice of all this when her uncle had told it to her. She did not wish to go back to Jamaica. She did not wish to wait at Belize. It was a clamorous longing of her heart to go after her father and to find him wherever he might be, and she did not care to consider anything else. Dame Charter added also her supplications. Her boy was with Blackbeard, and she wished to follow the pirate's ship, even if she should never see Major Bonnet, whom she loathed and despised, though never saying so. She would find her dickory. She, too, believed there must be some spark of feeling, even in a bloody pirate's heart, which would make him understand the love of a mother for her son, and he would let her have her boy. Mr. Delaplaine sat brooding on the deck. The righteous anger kindled by the conduct of his brother-in-law, and his grief for the poor stricken women, sobbing in the cabin, combined together to throw him into the most dolorous state of mind, which was aggravated by the knowledge that he could do nothing except to wait until the Belinda sailed back to Jamaica, and to go to Jamaica in her. As the unhappy merchant sat thus, his face buried in his hands, a small boat came alongside, and a passenger mounted to the deck. This person, after asking a few questions, approached Mr. Delaplaine. "'I have come, sir, to see you,' he said. "'I am Captain Ichabod of the Sloop Restless.' Mr. Delaplaine looked up in surprise. "'That is a pirate ship,' said he. "'Yes,' said the other. "'I'm a pirate.' The newcomer was a tall young man, with long dark hair, and with well-made features, and a certain diffidence in his manner which did not befit his calling. Mr. Delaplaine rose. This was his first private interview with a professional sea-robber and he did not know exactly how to demean himself. But as his visitor's manner was quiet, and as he came on board alone, it was not to be supposed that his intentions were offensive. "'And you wish to see me, sir?' said he. "'Yes,' said Captain Ichabod. "'I thought I'd come over and talk to you. "'I don't know you, bedad, but I know all about you and I saw you and your family when you came to town to visit that old fox, bedad, that sugar planter that Captain Blackbeard used to call Sir Nightcap. Not a bad joke either, bedad. I have heard of a good many dirty, mean things that people in my line of business have done, but, bedad, I never did hear of any captain who was dirty and mean to his own family." fine people, too, who come out to do the right thing by him, after he had been cleaned out, bedad, by one of his brothers of the coast. A rare sort of brother, bedad, don't you say so? You are right, sir, said Mr. Delaplaine, in what you say of the wild conduct of my brother-in-law Bonnet. It pleases me, sir, to know that you condemn it. Condemn? I should say so, bedad answered Captain Ichabod, and I came over here to say to you, that is, just to mention, not knowing, of course, what you'd think about it, but add, that I'm going to start on a cruise tomorrow, that is, as soon as I can get it in my water and my stores, but add, water anyway, and if you and your ladies might happen to fancy it, but add, I'll be glad to take you along. I've heard that you are in a bad case here, the captain of this brig being unable or quite unwilling to take you where you want to go. "'But where are you going, sir?' in great surprise. "'Anywhere,' said Captain Ichabod. "'Anywhere you'd like to go. I'm starting out on a cruise. 
and a cruise with me means anywhere. And my opinion is, sir, that if you want to come up with that crack-brained sugar planter, you'd better follow Blackbeard, and the best place to find him will be on the Carolina coast. That's his favorite hunting ground, bedad, and I expect the sugar planter is with him by this time. But will not that be dangerous, sir? asked Mr. Delaplaine. Oh, no, said the other. I know Blackbeard, and we have played many a game together. You and your family need not have anything to do with it. I'll board the revenge, and you may wager, bedad, that I'll bring Sir Nightcap back to you by the ear. But there's another, said Delaplaine. There's a young man belonging to my party. Oh, yes, I know, said the other. The young fellow Blackbeard took away with him. Clapped a cocked hat on him, bedad. That was a good joke. I will bring him too. One old man, one young man. I'll fetch them both. Then I'll take you all where you want to go. That is, as near as I can get to it, bedad. Now... You tell your ladies about this, and I'll have my sloop cleaned up a bit, and as soon as I can get my water on board, I'm ready to hoist anchor. But look you, sir, exclaimed Mr. Delaplaine, this is a very important matter, and cannot be decided so quickly. Oh, don't mention it, don't mention it, said Captain Ichabod, just you tell your ladies all about it, and I'll be ready to sail almost any time tomorrow. "'But, sir!' cried the merchant. "'Very good,' said the pirate captain. "'You talk it over. "'I'm going to the town now, "'and I'll row out to you this afternoon "'and get your instructions.' "'And with this he got over the side. "'Mr. Delaplaine said nothing of this visit, "'but waited on deck until the captain came on board, "'and then many were the questions he asked "'about the pirate Ichabod.' "'Well, well,' the captain exclaimed. "'That's just like him. He's a rare one. Ichabod is not his name, of course. "'And I'm told he belongs to a good English family. "'A younger son. "'And having taken his inheritance, he invested it in a sloop and turned pirate. "'He has had some pretty good fortune, I hear, in that line. "'But it hasn't profited him much.' "'for he is a terrible gambler, "'and all that he makes by his prizes "'he loses at cards, "'so he is nearly always poor. "'Blackbeard sometimes helps him, "'so I have heard, "'which he ought not to do, "'for the old pirate has won "'bags of money from him. "'But he is known as a good fellow, "'and to be trusted. "'I have heard of his sailing "'a long way back to Belize "'to pay a gambling debt he owed.' "'he having captured a merchantman in the meantime. "'Very honourable indeed,' remarked Mr. Delaplaine. "'As pirates go, a white crow,' said the other. "'Now, sir, if you and your ladies want to go to Blackbeard, "'and a rare desire is that, "'I swear you cannot do better than let Captain Ichabod take you. "'You will be safe.' I am sure of that, and there is every reason to think he will find his man. When Mr. Delaplaine went below with his extraordinary news, Dame Charter turned pale and screamed. "'Sail in a pirate ship!' she cried. "'I have seen the men belonging to one of them, and as to going on board and sailing with them, I'd rather die just where I am.' To the good dame's astonishment and that of Mr. Delaplaine, Kate spoke up very promptly. "'But you cannot die here, Dame Charter, and if you ever want to see your son again, you have got to go to him, which is also the case with me and my father. And, as there is no other way for us to go, I say, let us accept this man's offer, if he be what my uncle thinks he is.' After all, it might be as safe for us on board his ship as to be on a merchantman and be captured by pirates. 
which would be likely enough in those regions where we are obliged to go and so i say let us see the man and if he don't frighten us too much let us sail with him and get my father and dickory it would be a terrible danger a terrible danger said mr delaplaine but uncle urged kate everything is a terrible danger in the search we're upon let us then choose a danger that we know something about and which may serve our needs rather than one of which we're ignorant and which cannot possibly be of any good to us it was actually the fact that the little party in the cabin had not finished talking over this most momentous subject before they were informed that captain ichabod was on deck up they went dame charter ready to faint but she did not do so when she saw the visitor she thought it could not be the pirate captain but some one whom he had sent in his place he was more soberly dressed than when he first came on board and his manners were even milder the mind of kate bonnet was so worked up by the trouble that had come upon her that she felt very much as she did when she hung over the side of her father's vessel at bridgetown ready to drop into the darkness and the water when the signal should sound she had an object now as she had had then and again she must risk everything on her second look at captain ichabod which embarrassed him very much she was ready to trust him dame charter she whispered we must do it or never see them again so when they had talked about it for a quarter of an hour it was agreed that they would sail with captain ichabod when the sloop restless made ready to sail the next day there was a fine flurry in the harbor nothing of the kind had ever before happened there two ladies and a most respectable old gentleman sailing away under the skull and crossbones that was altogether new in the caribbean sea to those who talked to him about his chaotic expedition captain ichabod swore and at times as many men knew he was a great hand at being in earnest that if he carried not his passengers through their troubles and to a place of safety the restless and all on board of her should mount to the skies in a thousand bits although this alternative would not have been very comforting to said passengers if they had known of it it came from captain ichabod's heart and showed what sort of a man he was old captain sorby came to the restless in a boat and having previously washed one hand came on board and bade them all good-bye with great earnestness you will catch him he said to kate and my advice to you is when you get him hang him that's the only way to keep him out of mischief but as you are his daughter you may not like to string him up so i say put irons on him if you don't he'll be playing you some other wild trick he is not fit for a pirate anyway and he ought to be taken back to his calves and his chickens kate did not resent this language she even smiled a little sadly she had a great work before her and she could not mind trifles none of the other pirates came on board for they were afraid of sorby and when that great man had made the round of the decks and had given captain ichabod some bits of advice he got down into his boat the anchor was weighed the sails hoisted and amid shouts and cheers from a dozen small boats containing some of the most terrible and bloody sea robbers who had ever infested the face of the waters the restless sailed away the only pirate ship which had perhaps ever left port followed by blessings and goodwill goodwill although the words which expressed it were curses and the men who waved their hats were blasphemers and cutthroats away sailed our gentle and most respectable party with the jolly roger floating boldly high above them kate looking skyward noticed this and took courage to bewail the fact to captain ichabod he smiled 
when we're in sight of my brethren of the coast he said our skull and bones must wave but when we're well out at sea we will run up an english flag if it please you end of chapter twenty nine recording by meg Turasek. Chapter Thirty of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter Thirty Dame Charter Makes a Friend. Captain Ichabod was in a high feather. He whistled he sang, and he kept his men cleaning things. All that he could do for the comfort of his passengers he did, even going so far as to drop as many of his bedads as possible. Whenever he had an opportunity, and these came frequently, he talked to Mr. Delaplaine, addressing a word or two to Kate if he thought she looked gracious. For the first day or two Dame Charter kept below. She was afraid of the men, and did not even want to look at them, if she could help it. "'But the good woman's all wrong,' said Captain Ichabod to Mr. Delaplaine. "'My men would not hurt her. They're not the most tremendous kind of pirates, anyway, for I could not afford that sort.' I have often thought that I could make more profitable voyages if I had a savager lot of men. I'll tell you, sir, we once tried to board a big Spanish galleon, and the beastly foreigners beat us off, bedad, and we had a hard time of it getting away. There are three or four good fellows in the crew, tough old rascals who came with the sloop when I bought her. "'but most of my men are but poor knaves, "'and not to be afraid of. "'This comfort Mr. Delaplaine kept to himself, "'and on the second day out, "'the food which was served to him "'being most wretchedly cooked, "'Dame Charter ventured into the galley "'to see if she could do anything "'in the way of improvement. "'I think you may eat this,' she said "'when she returned to Kate. "'But I don't think that anything on board is fit for you. When I went to the kitchen, I came near dropping dead right in the doorway. That cook, Mistress Kate, is the most terrible creature of all the pirates that ever were born. His eyes are blistering green, and his beard is all twisted into points, with the ends stuck fast with blood, which has never been washed off. He roars like a lion, with shining teeth, "'But he speaks very fair, Mistress Kate. "'You would be amazed to hear how fair he speaks. "'He told me, and every word he said set my teeth on edge with its grating, "'that he wanted to know how I liked the meals cooked, "'that he would do it right if there were things on board to do it with, "'which there are not, Mistress Kate.' "'And when he was beaten up the batter for me, "'and I asked him if he was not tired working so hard, "'he pulled up his sleeve and showed me his arm, "'which was like a horse's leg, all covered with hair, "'and asked me if I thought it was likely "'he could tear himself with a spoon. "'I'm sure he would give us better food if he could, "'for he leaned over and whispered to me, "'like a gust of wind coming in through the door.' that the captain was in a very hard case, having lately lost everything he had at the gaming table, and therefore had not the money to store the ship as he would have done. "'Oh, don't talk about that, Dame Charter,' said Kate. "'If we can get enough to eat, no matter what it is, we must be satisfied and think only of our great joy in sailing to my father and to your dickery.' That afternoon Captain Ichabod found Kate by herself on deck, and he made bold to sit down by her, and before he knew what he was about, he was telling her his whole story. She listened carefully to what he said. He touched but lightly upon his wickedness, although they were plain enough to any listener of sense, 
and bemoaned his fearful passion for gaming which was sure to bring him to misery one day or another when i have staked my vessel and have lost it said he then there will be an end of me but why don't you sell your vessel before you lose it said kate and become a farmer his eyes brightened i never thought of that said he but dad uh, excuse me miss some day when i've got a little together and can pay my men i'll sell this sloop and buy a farm but dad uh, i beg your pardon miss i'll buy a farm kate smiled but it was easy to see that captain ichabod was in earnest the next day captain ichabod came to mr delaplaine and took him to one side i want to speak to you he said about a bit of business you may have noticed sir that we are somewhat short of provisions and the way of it is this the night before we sailed hoping to make a bold stroke at the card table and thereby fit out my vessel in a manner suitable to the entertainment of a gentleman and ladies i lost every penny i had i did hope that our provisions would last us a few days longer but i am disappointed sir that cook of mine who is a soft-hearted fellow his neck always ready for a heel of a woman has thrown overboard even the very stores we had left for you the good dame charter having told him they were not fit to eat and more sir even my men are grumbling so i thought i would speak to you and explain that it would be necessary for us to overhaul a merchant man and replenish our food supply it can be done very quietly sir and i don't think that even the ladies need be disturbed mr delaplaine stared in amazement do you mean to say he exclaimed that you want me to consent to your committing piracy for our benefit yes sir answered the captain that's what i suppose you would call it but that's my business now sir i wish you to know that i am a christian and a gentleman said mr delaplaine that's all very true bedad said captain ichabod but you're also another thing you're a human being and you must eat this is terrible exclaimed the merchant that at my time of life i should consent to a felony at sea and to profit by it i cannot bear to think of the wickedness and the disgrace of it most respected sir said ichabod if the fellows behave themselves properly and don't offer to fight us then there'll be no wickedness bedad i can make a good enough show of men to frighten any ordinary merchant crew so that not a blow need be struck and that is what i expect to do sir i would not have any disturbance before ladies you may be sure of that bedad we bear down upon a vessel we order her to surrender we take what we want and we let her go truly there's no wickedness in that and as for the disgrace we can all better bear that than starve mr delaplaine looked at the pirate without a word he could not comprehend how a man with such a frank and honest face could thus avow his dishonest principles but as he gazed and wondered the thought of a scheme flashed across the mind of the merchant a thoroughly business-like scheme this bold young pirate captain might seize upon such supplies as they were in need of but he felix delaplaine of spanish town jamaica would pay for them thus might their necessities be relieved and their consciences kept clean but he said nothing of this to ichabod the pirate might deem such a proceeding unprofessional and interpose some objection payment would be the merchant's part of the business and he would attend to it himself a look of resignation now came over mr delaplaine's face captain said he i must yield to your reason it is absolutely necessary that we shall not starve ichabod's face shone and he held out his hand bedad sir he cried 
I honor you as a bold gentleman and a kind one. I will instantly lay my course somewhat to the eastward. And I promise you, sir, it will not be long before we run across some of these merchant fellows. I beg you, sir, speak to your ladies and tell them that there will be no unpleasant commotion. We may draw our swords and make a fierce show, but, bedad, I don't believe there will be any fighting. We shall want so little, for I would not attempt to take a regular prize with ladies on board, that the fellows will surely deliver what we demand, the quicker to make an end of it. If you are perfectly sure, said Mr. Delaplaine, that you can restrain your men from violence, I would like to be a member of your boarding party. It would be a rare experience for me. Now Captain Ichabod fairly shouted with delight. Bravo, bravo, he exclaimed. I didn't dream, sir, that you were a man of such noble spirit. You shall go with us, sir. Your presence will aid greatly in making our hoped-for capture a most orderly affair. No one can look upon you, bedad, without knowing that you are a high-minded and honorable man and would not take a box or case from any one if you did not need it. Now, sir, we shall put about, and by good fortune we may soon sight a merchantman. Even if it be but a coastwise trader, it may serve our purpose. Mr. Delaplaine, with something of a smile upon his sedate face, hurried to Kate, who was upon the quarter-deck. My dear, we are about to introduce a little variety into our dull lives. As soon as we can overhaul a merchant man, we shall commit a piracy. But don't turn pale. I have arranged it all. You! exclaimed the wide-eyed Kate. Yes, said her uncle, and he told her his tale. And remember this, my dear, he added. If we cannot pay, we do not eat. I shall be as relentless as the bloody Blackbeard. If they take not my money, I shall swear to Ichabod that we touch not their goods. And you are sure, she said, that there will be no bloodshed? I vouch for that, said he, for I shall lead the boarding party. She took him by both hands. Why? she said. It need be no more than laying in goods from a storehouse, and I cannot but be glad, dear uncle, for I am so very, very hungry. Now Dame Charter came running and puffing. Do you know, she cried, that there is to be a piracy? The word has just been passed, and the cook told me. There is to be no bloodshed, and the other ship will not be burned and the people will not be made to walk a plank. The captain has given those orders, and he is very firm, swearing, I am told, much more than is his wont. It is dreadful, it is awful, just to think about. But the provisions are gone, and it is absolutely necessary to do something, and it will really be very exciting. The cook tells me he will put me in a good place where I cannot be hurt, and where I shall see everything. And, Mistress Kate and Master Delaplaine, I dare say he can take care of you, too. Kate looked at her uncle as if to ask if she might tell the good woman what sort of piracy this was to be, but he shook his head. It would not do to interfere any more than was necessary with the regular progress of events. The captain came up, excited. Even now, bedad, he cried, there are two sails in sight, one far north and the other to the eastward, beating up this way. This one we shall make for. We have the wind with us, which is a good thing, for the restless is a bad sailor and has lost many a prize through that fault. And now, miss, he said, addressing Kate, I shall have to ask your leave to take down that English flag and run up our jolly Roger. It will be necessary, for if the fellows fear not our long guns, 
they may change their course and get away from us. That will be right, said Kate. If we are going to be pirates, we might as well be pirates out and out. Captain Ichabod glowed with delight. What a girl this was, and what an uncle! It was not long, for the restless had a fair wind, before the sail to the eastward came fully into sight. She was, in good truth, a merchantman, and not a large one. Dame Charter, very much excited, wondered what she would have on board. "'The cook tells me,' she said to Kate, "'that sometimes ships from the other side of the ocean carry the most astonishing and beautiful things.' "'But we shall not see these things,' said Kate, "'even if that ship carries them. "'We shall take but food, "'and shall not unnecessarily despoil them of that. "'We may be pirates, but we shall not be wicked.' "'It is hard to see the difference,' said Dame Charter with a sigh. "'But we must eat. "'The cook tells me that they have made peaceful prizes before now. This they do when they want some particular thing, such as food or money, and care not for the trouble of stripping the ship, putting all on board to death, and then setting her afire. The cook never does any boarding himself, so he says, but he stands on the deck here, armed with his great axe, which likes him better than a cutlass, and no matter what happens, he defends his kitchen." "'From his looks,' said Kate, "'I should imagine him to be the fiercest fighter among them all.' "'That is not so,' said Dame Charter. "'He tells me that he is of a very peaceable mind, "'and would never engage in any broils or fights if he could help it. "'Look, look!' she cried. "'They're running out their long brass guns. "'And do you see that other ship?' "'how her sails are fluttering in the wind? "'And there, that little spot at the top of her mast, "'that's her flag, and it's coming down. "'Down, down it comes, "'and I must run to the cook and ask him "'what will happen next.'" End of Chapter 30 Recording by Meg Turasek Chapter Thirty One of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter Thirty One Mr. Delaplaine Leads a Boarding Party. Steadily southward sailed the brig Black Swan, which bore upon its decks the happy Mander family, and our poor friend Dickory, carrying with him his lifelong destiny in the shape of the blood-stained letter from Captain Vince. The sackcloth draperies of Lucilla, with the red cord lightly tied about them, had given place to a very ordinary gown fashioned by her mother and herself which added so few charms to her young face and sparkling eyes that Dickory often thought that he wished there were some bushes on deck so that she might stand behind them and let him see only her face, as he had seen it when first he met her. But he saw the pretty face a great deal, for Lucilla was very anxious to know things, and asked many questions about Barbados and also asked if there was any probability that the brig would go straight on to that lovely island without bothering to stop at Jamaica. It was during such talks as this that Dickory forgot, when he did forget, the blood-stained letter that he carried with him always. Our young friend still wore the naval uniform, although in coming on the brig he had changed it for some rough sailor's clothes. But Lucilla had besought him to be again a brave lieutenant. They sailed and they sailed, and there was but little wind, and that from the south and against them. But Lucilla did not complain at their slow progress. 
the slowest vessel in the world was preferable just now to a desert island which never moved david's was at the wheel and mander stood near him these old friends had not yet finished talking about what had happened in the days since they had seen each other mrs mander sat not far away still making clothes and the little lena was helping her in her childlike way lucilla and dickory were still talking about barbados there never was a girl who wanted to know so much about an island as that girl wanted to know about barbados suddenly there was a shout from above what's that asked mander a sail said davids peering out over the sea but able to see nothing lucilla and dickory did not cease talking at that moment lucilla did not care greatly about sails there was so much to be said about barbados there was a good deal of talking forward and after a while the captain walked to the quarter-deck he was a gruff man and his face was troubled i am sorry to say he growled that the ship we have sighted is a pirate she flies the black flag now there was no more talk about barbados or what had happened to old friends and the sewing dropped on the deck those poor manders were chilled to the soul were they again to be taken by pirates captain cried mander what can we do can we run away from them we could not run away from their guns growled the captain and there is nothing to do they intend to take this brig and that's the reason they have run up their skull and bones they are bearing directly down upon us with a fair wind they will be firing a gun presently and then i shall lay to and wait for them mander stepped towards dickory and lucilla his voice was husky as he said we cannot expect my dear that we shall again be captured by forbearing pirates i shall kill my wife and little daughter rather than they shall fall into the bloody hands of ordinary pirates and to you sir i will commit the care of my lucilla if this vessel is delivered over to a horde of savages i pray you plunge your dirk into her heart yes said lucilla clinging to the arm of dickory if those fierce pirates shall attack us we will die together dickory shook his head in an awful moment such as this he could hold out no illusions no said he i cannot die with you i have a duty before me and until it is accomplished i cannot willingly give up my life i must rather be even a pirate's slave than that but i will accept your father's charge should there be need i will kill you thank you very much said lucilla coolly to the surprise of the people on the black swan there came no shot from the approaching pirate but as she still bore down upon them running before the wind the captain of the brig lay to and lowered his flag submission now was all there was before them no man on the brig took up arms nor did the crew form themselves into any show of resistance that would have but made matters worse as the pirate vessel came on nearer and nearer a great number of men could be seen stretched along her deck and some brass cannon were visible trained upon the unfortunate brig but to the surprise of the captain of the black swan and of nearly everybody on board of her the pirate did not run down upon her to make fast and board instead of that she put about into the wind and lay to less than a quarter of a mile away then two boats were lowered and filled with men who rowed towards the brig they have special reasons for our capture said the captain to those who were crowding about him he may well be laden now with plunder and comes to us for our gold and silver or it may be that he merely wants the brig if that be so 
he can quickly rid himself of us. That was a cruel speech when women had to hear it, but the captain was a rough fellow. The boats came on as quietly as if they were about to land at a neighboring pier. Dickory and Lucilla cautiously peeped over the rail, Dickory without his hat, and Lucilla hiding herself, all but a part of her face, behind him. The manders crouched together on the deck, the father with glaring eyes and a knife in his hand. The crew stood, with their hats removed and their chins lowered, waiting for what might happen next. Up to this time Dickory had shown no signs of fear, although his mind was terribly tossed and disturbed. For whatever might happen to him, it possibly would be the end of that mission, which was now the only object of his life. But he grated his teeth together and awaited his fate. But now, as the boats came nearer, he began to tremble, and gradually his knees shook under him. I would not have believed that he was such a coward as that, thought Lucilla. The boats neared the ship and were soon made fast. Every help was offered by the crew of the brig, and not a sign of resistance was shown. The leader of the pirates mounted to the deck, followed by the greater part of his men. For a moment Captain Ichabod glanced about him, and then, addressing the captain of the brig, he said, "'This is all very well. I am glad to see that you have sense enough to take things as you find them, and not to stir up a fracas and make trouble. I overhauled you that I might lay in a stock of provisions, and some wine and spirits besides, having no desire, if you treat us rightly, to despoil you further.' So, we shall have no more words about it, bedad, and if you will set your men to work to get on deck such stores as my quartermaster here may demand of you, we shall get through this business quickly. In the meantime, lower two or three boats, so that your men can row the goods over to my vessel. The captain of the Black Swan simply bowed his head and turned away to obey orders, while Captain Ichabod stepped a little aft and began to survey the captured vessel. As soon as his back was turned, the captain of the brig was approached by a very respectable elderly gentleman, apparently not engaged either in the mercantile marine or in piratical pursuits, who stopped him and said, "'Sir, my name is Felix Delaplaine, merchant of Spanish Town, Jamaica.' I am, against my will, engaged in this piratical attack upon your vessel, but I wish to assure you privately that I will not consent to have you robbed of your property, and that, although some of your provisions may be taken by these pirates, I here promise, as an honorable gentleman, to pay you the full value of all that they seize upon." The captain of the Black Swan had no opportunity to make an answer to this most extraordinary statement, for at that moment a naval officer, shouting at the top of his voice, came rushing towards the respectable gentleman who had just been making such honorable proposals. Almost at the same moment there was a great shout from Captain Ichabod, who, drawing his cutlass from its sheath, raised the glittering blade and dashed in pursuit of the naval gentleman. "'Hold there! Hold there!' cried the pirate. "'Don't you touch him! Don't you lay your hand upon him!' But Ichabod was not quick enough. Dickory, swift as a stag, stretched out both his arms and threw them around the neck of the amazed Mr. Delaplaine. Now the pirate Ichabod reached the two. His great sword went high in the air, and was about to descend upon the naval person, whoever he was, who had made such an unprovoked attack upon his honored passenger, when his arm was caught by some one from behind. Turning, with a great curse, 
his eyes fell upon the face of a young girl. "'Oh, don't kill him, don't kill him!' she cried. "'He will hurt nobody. He is only hugging the old gentleman.' Captain Ichabod looked from the girl to the two men, who were actually embracing each other. Dickory's back was towards him, but the face of Mr. Delaplaine fairly glowed with delight. "'Oh, ho!' said Ichabod, turning to Lucilla. "'And what does this mean, Bedad?' "'I don't know,' she answered, "'but the gentleman in the uniform is a good man. "'Perhaps the other one is his father.' "'To my eyes,' said Captain Ichabod, "'this is a most fearsome mix.' The Mander family, and nearly everybody else on board, crowded about the little group, gazing with all their eyes, but asking no questions. "'Captain Ichabod!' exclaimed Mr. Delaplaine, holding Dickory by the hand. "'This is one of the two persons you were taking us to find. This is Dickory Charter, the son of good Dame Charter.' now on your vessel. He went away with Blackbeard, and we were in search of him. Oh, ho! Oh, cried Captain Ichabod. By my life I believe it. That's the young fellow that Blackbeard dressed up in a cocked hat and took away with him. I am the same person, sir, said Dickory. So far so good, said Captain Ichabod. I am very glad that I did not bring down my cutlass on you, which I should have done, bedad, had it not been for this young woman. Now up spoke Mr. Delaplaine. We have found you, Dickory, he cried. But what can you tell us of Major Bonnet? Aye, aye, said Captain Ichabod. There's another one we're after. Where's the runaway, Sir Nightcap? Alas, said Dickory, I do not know. I escaped from Blackbeard, and since that day have heard nothing. I had supposed that Captain Bonnet was in your company, Mr. Delaplaine. Now the captain of the Black Swan pushed himself forward. Is it Captain Bonnet, lately of the pirate ship Revenge, that you're talking about? he asked. If so, I may tell you something of him. I am lately from Charlestown, and the talk there was that Blackbeard was lying outside the harbour in Steed Bonnet's old vessel, and that Bonnet had lately joined him. I did not venture out of port until I had certain news that these pirates had sailed northward. They had two or three ships, and the talk was that they were bound to the Virginias, and perhaps still farther north. They were fitted out for a long cruise. "'Gone again!' exclaimed Mr. Delaplaine in a hoarse voice. "'Gone again!' Captain Ichabod's face grew clouded. "'Gone north of Charlestown!' he exclaimed. "'That's bad, Bedad. "'That's very bad. "'You are sure he did not sail southward?' he asked of the captain of the brig. That gruff mariner was in a strange state of mind. He had just been captured by a pirate, and in the next moment had made what might be a very profitable sale to a respectable merchant of the goods the pirate was about to take from him. Moreover, the said pirate seemed to be in the employ of said merchant, and, altogether, Things seemed to him to be in as fearsome a mix as they had seemed to Captain Ichabod, but he brought his mind down to the question he had been asked. "'No doubt about that,' said he. "'There were some of his men in the town, for they are afraid of nobody, and they were not backward in talking. "'That upsets things badly.' said Captain Ichabod, without unclouding his brow. With my slow vessel and my empty purse, Bedad, I don't see how I am ever going to take Blackbeard if he has gone north. 
finding Blackbeard would have been a handful of trumps to me. But the game seems to be up, bedad. The captain of the brig and Ichabod's quartermaster went away to attend to the transfer of the needed goods to the restless. Mander and his wife and little daughter were standing together gazing with amazement at the strange pirates who had come aboard, while Lucilla stepped up to Dickory, who stood silent, with his eyes on the deck. "'Can you tell me what this means?' said she. For a moment he did not answer, and then he said, "'I don't know everything myself, but I must presently go on board that vessel.' "'What?' exclaimed Lucilla, stepping back. Is she there? Yes, said Dickory. End of chapter 31 Recording by Meg Turosek Chapter 32 of Kate Bonnet This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton Chapter 32 The Delivery of the Letter The sea was smooth and the wind light, and the transfer of provisions from the Black Swan to the Pirate Sloop which two ships now lay as near each other as safety would permit, was accomplished quietly. During the progress of the transfer, Captain Ichabod's boat was rowed back to his ship, and its arrival was watched with great interest by everybody on board that pirate sloop. Kate and Dame Charter, as well as all the men who stood looking over the rail, were amazed to see a naval officer accompanying the captain and Mr. Delaplaine on their return. But that amazement was greatly increased when that officer, as soon as he set foot upon the deck, removed his hat and made directly for Dame Charter, who, with a scream loud enough to frighten the fishes, enfolded him in her arms and straightway fainted. It was like a sun coming out of the sea, sure enough, as she afterwards stated. Kate, recognizing Dickory, hurried to him with a scream of her own, and both hands outstretched. But the young fellow, who seemed greatly distressed at the unconscious condition of his mother, did not greet Mistress Bonnet with the enthusiastic delight which might have been expected under the circumstances. He seemed troubled and embarrassed, which, perhaps, was not surprising, for never before had he seen his mother faint. Kate was about to offer some assistance, but as the good dame now showed signs of returning consciousness, she thought it would be better to leave the two together, and in a state of amazement she was hurrying to her uncle when Dickory rose from the side of his mother and stopped her. "'I have a letter for you,' he said in a husky voice. "'A letter?' she cried. "'From my father?' "'No,' said he, "'from Captain Vince.' "'And he handed her the blood-stained missive. "'Kate turned pale and stared at him. "'Here was horrible mystery. "'The thought flashed through the young girl's mind "'that the wicked captain had killed her father "'and had written to tell her so. "'Is my father dead?' she gasped. "'Not that I know of.' said Dickory. "'Where is he?' she cried. "'I do not know,' was the answer. She stood, holding the letter, while Dickory returned to his mother. Mr. Delaplaine saw her standing thus, pale and shocked, but he did not hasten to her. He had sad things to say to her, for his practical mind told him that it would not be possible to continue the search for her father he having put himself out of the reach of Captain Ichabod and his inefficient sloop. If Dickory had said anything about her father, which had so cast her down, how much harder would it be for him when he had to tell her the whole truth? But Kate did not wait for further speech from anybody. 
she gave a great start and then rushed down the companionway to her cabin there with her door shut she opened the letter this was the letter written in lead pencil in an irregular but bold hand with some letters partly dimmed where the paper had been damp at the very end of my life i write to you that you have escaped the fiercest love that ever a man had for a woman i shall carry this love with me to hell if it may be but you have escaped it this escape is a blessing and now that i cannot help it i give it to you had i lived i should have shed the blood of every one whom you loved to gain you and you would have cursed me so love me now for dying yours anywhere and always christopher vince kate put down the letter and some color came into her face she bowed her head in thankful prayer he's dead she said and now he cannot harm my father that was the only thought she had regarding this hot-brained and infatuated lover he was dead her father was safe from him how he died how dickory came to bring the letter how anything had happened that had happened except the death of captain vince did not at this moment concern her not until now had she known how the fear of the vengeful captain of the badger had constantly been with her over and over again dickory told his tale to his mother she interrupted him so much with her embraces that he could not explain things clearly to her but she did not care she had him with her he was with her and she had fast hold of him and she would never let him go again what mattered it what sort of clothes he wore or where he had escaped from a family on a desert island or from a pirate crew she had him and her happiness knew no bounds dickory was perfectly willing to stay with her and to talk to her he did not care to be with anybody else not even with mistress kate who had taken so much interest in him all the time he had been away though of course not so much interest as his own dear mother then the good dame charter being greatly recovered and so happy began to talk of herself slipping in a disjointed way over her various experiences she told her dear boy in strictest confidence that she was very much disappointed in the way pirates took ships she thought it was going to be something very exciting that she would remember to the end of her days and wake up in the middle of the night and scream when she thought of it but it was nothing of the kind not a shot was fired not a drop of blood shed there was not even a shout or a yell or a scream for mercy it was all like going into the pantry to get the flour and the sugar she was all the time waiting for something to happen and nothing ever did dickory smiled but it was like watered milk i do not understand such piracy he said but suppose dear mother that these pirates had taken that ship in the usual way i being on board at this he was clasped so tightly to his mother's breast that he could say no more the boats plied steadily between the two vessels and on one of the trips mr delaplaine went over to the brig on business and also glad to escape for a little the dreaded interview which must soon come between himself and his niece now sir said the merchant to the captain of the brig you will make a bill against me for the provisions which are being taken to that pirate and i hope you have reserved a sufficient store of food for your own maintenance until you reach a port and that of myself and two women who wish to sail with you craving most earnestly that you will land us in jamaica or in some place convenient of access to that island which i can do said the captain for i am bound to kingston and as to subsistence shall have plenty on the brig mr delaplaine found captain ichabod 
who had come over to superintend operations, and who was now talking to the pretty girl who had seized him by the arm when he was about to slay the naval officer. "'I would talk with you, Captain,' said the merchant, "'on a matter of immediate import.' and he led the pirate away from the pretty girl. The matter to be discussed was, indeed, of deep import. "'I am loath to say it, sir,' said Mr. Delaplaine. "'When I think of the hospitality and most exceptional kindness with which you have treated me and my niece, and for which we shall feel grateful all our lives, but I think you will agree with me that it would be useless for us to pursue the search after that most reprehensible person, my brother-in-law, Bonnet. There can be no doubt, I believe, that he and Blackbeard have left the vicinity of Charlestown, and have gone, we know not where. No doubt of that, Bedad, said Ichabod, knitting his brow as he spoke. If Blackbeard had been outside the harbor, this brig would not have been here. And therefore, sir, continued Mr. Delaplaine, I have judged it to be wise, and indeed necessary, for us to part company with you, sir, and to take passage on this brig, which, by a most fortunate chance, is bound for Kingston. My niece, I know, will be greatly disappointed by this course of events, but we have no choice but to fall in with them. I don't like to agree with you, said the captain, but, but, Dad, I am bound to do it. I am disappointed myself, sir, but I have been disappointed so often that I suppose I ought to be used to it. If I had caught up with Blackbeard, I should have been all right, and after I had settled your affairs, and I know I could have done that, I think I would have joined him. But all I can do now is to hammer along at the business, take prizes in the usual way, and wait for Blackbeard to come south again, and then I'll either sell out or join him. It is a great pity, sir, said Mr. Delaplaine, a great pity. Yes, it is, interrupted Ichabod. It's a very great pity, sir, a very great pity. If I had known more about ships when I bought the Restless, I would have had a faster craft, and by this time I might have been a man of comfortable means. But that sloop over there, bedad, is so slow that many a time, sir, I have seen a fat merchantman sail away from her and leave us, in spite of our guns, cursing and swearing miles behind. I am sorry to have you leave me, sir, and with your ladies, but, as you say, here's your chance to get home, and I don't know when I could give you another. Mr. Delaplaine replied courteously and gratefully, and by the next boat he went back to the Restless. Captain Ichabod, his brow still clouded by the approaching separation, walked over to Lucilla and continued his conversation with her about the island of Barbados, a subject of which he knew very little, and she nothing. When Kate returned to the deck she found Dickory alone, Dame Charter having gone to talk to the cook about the wonderful things which had happened, of which she knew very little and he nothing at all. "'Dickory,' said Kate, "'I want to talk to you, and that quickly.' I have heard nothing of what has happened to you. How did you get possession of the letter you brought me? And what do you know of Captain Vince? I can tell you nothing, he said without looking at her, until you tell me what I ought to know about Captain Vince. And as he said this, he could not help wondering in his heart that there were no signs of grief about her. Ought to know she repeated, regarding him earnestly. Well, you and I have always been good friends, and I will tell you. And then she told him the story of the captain of the Badger, of his love-making, and of his commission to sail upon the sea, and destroy the pirate ship Revenge, 
and all on board of her. And now, she said, as she concluded, I think it would be well for you to read this letter. And she handed him the missive he had carried so long, and with such pain. He read the bold, uneven lines, and then he turned and looked upon her, his face shining like morning sky. "'Then you have never loved him?' he gasped. "'Why should I?' said Kate. "'In spite of the fact that there were a great many people on board that pirate sloop who might see him, in spite of the fact that there were people in boats plying upon the water who might notice his actions, Dickory fell upon his knees before Kate, and, seizing her hand, he pressed it to his lips. "'Why should I?' said Kate, quietly drawing her hand from him. "'For I have a devoted lover already, Master Martin Newcombe of Barbados.' Dickory, repulsed, rose to his feet, but his face did not lose its glow. He had heard so much about Martin Newcombe that he had ceased to mind him. "'To think of it!' he cried. "'To think how I stood and watched him fight, how I admired and marveled at his wonderful strength and skill, his fine figure, and his flashing eye, how my soul went out to him, how I longed that he might kill that scoundrel Blackbeard. And all the time he was your enemy. He was my enemy. He was a viler wretch than even the bloody pirate who killed him. Oh, Kate, Kate, if I had but known. Miss Kate, if you please, said the girl. And it is well, Dickory, you did not know for then you might have jumped upon him and struck him in the back, and that would have been dishonorable. He thought, said Dickory, not in the least abashed by his reproof, that the revenge was commanded by your father, for he sprang upon the deck, shouting for the captain, and when he saw Blackbeard I heard him exclaim in surprise, A sugar planter! And he would have killed my father, said Kate, "'turning pale at the thought. "'Yes,' replied Dickory, "'he would have killed any man except the great Blackbeard. "'And to think of it, I stood there watching them, "'and wishing that vile Englishman the victory. "'Oh, Kate, you should have seen that wonderful pirate fight. "'No man could have stood before him.' "'Then, with sparkling eyes and waving arms, "'he told her of the combat.' When he had finished, the souls of these two young people were united in an overpowering admiration, almost reverence, for the prowess and strength of the wicked and bloody pirate who had slain the captain of the Badger. When Mr. Delaplaine came on board, Kate, who had been waiting, took him aside. "'Uncle,' she exclaimed, "'I have great news. Captain Vince is dead.' At least he came up with the revenge, but instead of finding my father in command, he found Blackbeard, who killed him. Now my father is safe. The good man scarcely knew what to say to this bright-faced girl, whose father's safety was all the world to her. If he had heard that his worthlessness and wicked brother-in-law had been killed, it would have been trouble and sorrow for the present, but it would have been peace for the future but he was a Christian gentleman and a loving uncle, and he banished this thought from his heart. He listened to Kate as she rapidly went on talking, but he did not hear her. His mind was busy with the news he had to tell her, the news that she must give up her loving search and go back with him to Spanish Town. "'And now, uncle,' said Kate, "'there's another thing I want to say to you. Since this great grief has been lifted from my soul, since I know that no wrathful and vindictive captain of a man of war is scouring the seas, armed with authority to kill my father and savage for his life, I feel that it is not right for me to put other people who are so good to me to sad discomfort, 
and great expense to try to follow my father into regions far away and to us almost unknown. Some day he will come back into this part of the world, and I hope he may return disheartened and weary of his present mode of life, and then I may have a better chance of winning him back to the domestic life he used to love so much. But he is safe, uncle, and that is everything now. And so I came to say to you that I think it would be well for us to relieve this Captain Ichabod from the charges and labors he has taken upon himself for our sakes, and, if it be possible, engage that ship yonder to take us back to Jamaica. She was sailing in that direction, and her captain might be induced to touch at Kingston. This is what I have been thinking about, dear uncle, and do you not agree with me? High rose the spirits of good Mr. Delaplaine. Banished was all the overhanging blackness of his dreaded interview with Kate. Some day he will come back into this part of the world, and I hope he may return disheartened and weary of his present mode of life, and then I may have a better chance of winning him back to the domestic life he used to love so much. But he is safe, uncle, and that is everything now. And so I came to say to you that I think it would be well for us to relieve this Captain Ichabod from the charges and labors he has taken upon himself for our sakes, and, if it be possible, engage that ship yonder to take us back to Jamaica. She was sailing in that direction, and her captain might be induced to touch at Kingston. This is what I have been thinking about, dear uncle, and do you not agree with me? High rose the spirits of the good Mr. Delaplaine. Banished was all the overhanging blackness of his dreaded interview with Kate. The sky was bright. Her soul was singing songs of joy and thankfulness, and his soul might join her. He never appreciated better than now the blessings which might be shed upon humanity by the death of a bad man. His mind even gambled a little in his relief. But Kate, he said, if we leave that kind Captain Ichabod, and he be not restrained by our presence, then, my dear, he will return to his former evil ways, and his next captures will not be like this one, but like ordinary piracies, sinful in every way. Uncle, said Kate, looking up into his face, it is too much to ask of one young girl to undertake the responsibilities of two pirates. I hope some day to be of benefit to my poor father, and when it comes to Captain Ichabod, kind as he has been, I am afraid I will have to let him go and manage the affairs for his soul for himself. Her uncle smiled upon her. Now that he was to go back to his home and take his dear girl with him, he was ready to smile at almost anything. That he thought one pirate much better worth saving than the other, and that his choice did not agree with that of his niece, was not for him to even think about at such a happy moment. It was not long after this conversation that the largest boat belonging to the restless was rowed over to the brig, and in it sat not only Kate, Dame Charter, and Dickory, but Captain Ichabod, who would accompany his guests to take proper leave of them. The crew of the pirate sloop crowded themselves along her sides, and even mounted into her shrouds, waving their hat and shouting as the boat moved away. The cook was the loudest shouter, and his ragged hat waved highest, and, as Dame Charter shook her handkerchief above her head, and gazed back at her savage friend, there was moisture in her eyes. Up to this moment she never would have believed that she would have grieved to depart from a pirate vessel and to leave behind a pirate cook. Lucilla watched carefully the newcomers as they ascended to the deck of the Black Swan. "'That is the girl,' she said to herself, "'and I am not surprised.' A little later she remarked to Captain Ichabod, 
who sat by her. Are they mother and daughter, those two? Oh, no, said he. Mistress Bonnet is too fine a lady and too beautiful to be daughter of that old woman, who is her attendant and the mother of the young fellow in the cocked hat. Too fine and beautiful, repeated Lucilla. I greatly grieve to leave you all, continued the young pirate captain, although some of you I have known so short a time. It will be very lonesome when I sail away, with none to speak to save the bloody dogs I command, who may yet throttle me. And it is to Barbados you go to settle with your family? That is our destination, said Lucilla, but I know not if we shall find the money to settle there. We were taken by pirates and lost everything. Now the captain of the brig came up to Ichabod, and informed him that the goods he demanded had been delivered on board his vessel, and that the brig was ready to sail. It was the time for leave-taking, but Ichabod was tardy. Presently he approached Kate, and drew her to one side. "'Dear lady,' he said, and his voice was hesitating, while a slight flush of embarrassment appeared on his face. You may have thought, dear lady, he repeated, you may have thought that so fair a being as yourself should have attracted during the days we have sailed together, may have attracted, but dad, I mean, the declared admiration even of a fellow like myself, we being so much together. But I had heard your story, fair lady, and of the courtship paid you by Captain Vince of the Corvette Badger, whose family I knew in England, and acknowledging his superior claims, I constantly refrained, though not without great effort, I must say that much for myself, fair lady, from, from, addressing me, I suppose you mean, said Kate. What you say, kind captain, redounds to your honor, and I thank you for your noble consideration. But I feel bound to tell you that there was never anything between me and Captain Vince, and he is now dead. The young pirate stepped back suddenly and opened wide his eyes. What? he exclaimed. And all this time you were... Not free, she interrupted with a smile for I have a lover on the island of Barbados. Barbados, repeated Captain Ichabod, and he bade Kate a most courteous farewell. All the goodbyes had been said, and good wishes had been wished, when, just as he was about to descend to his boat, Captain Ichabod turned to Lucilla. And it is truly to Barbados you go? he asked. Yes, said she. I think we shall certainly do that. Now his face flushed. And do you care for that fellow in the cocked hat? Here was a cruel situation for poor Lucilla. She must lie or lose two men. She might lose them anyway, but she would not do it of her own free will. And so she lied. Not a whit, said Lucilla. The eyes of Ichabod brightened as he went down the side of the brig. End of chapter 32 Recording by Meg Turasek Chapter 33 of Kate Bonnet This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton Chapter 33 Blackbeard Gives Greenway Some Difficult Work The great pirate Blackbeard, inactive and taking his ease, was seated on the quarter-deck of his fine vessel, on which he had lately done some sharp work off the harbour of Charlestown. He was now commanding a small fleet, 
Besides the ship on which he sailed, he had two other vessels, well manned and well laden with supplies from his recent captures. Satisfied with conquest, he was sailing northward to one of his favorite resorts on the North Carolina coast. To this conquering hero now came Ben Greenway, the Scotchman, touching his hat. "'And what do you want?' cried the burly pirate. "'Haven't they given you your prize money yet, or isn't it enough?' "'Prize money!' exclaimed Greenway. "'I had none of it, nor will I have any. "'What money I have, and it is but little, came to me fairly.' "'Oh, ho!' cried Blackbeard. "'And you have money, then, have you? "'Is it enough to make it worth my while to take it?' "'You can count it and see whenever you like,' said Ben. "'But it isna money that I came to talk to you about. "'I came to ask you, at the first convenient season, "'to put me on board that ship out there, "'that I may be in my rightful place by the side of Master Bonnet.' "'And what good are you to him, or he to you?' "'asked the pirate, with a fine long oath, "'that I should put myself to that much trouble.' "'I have the responsibility of his soul on my hands,' said Ben. "'And since we left Charlestown, I ha' not seen him, "'he bein' on un a ship, and I on another. "'And very well that is, too,' said Blackbeard, "'for I like each of you better separate. "'And now look ye, me Kirk bird, "'you have not done very well with your responsibilities so far.' and you might as well make up your mind to stop trying to convert that sneak of a nightcap, and take up the business of converting me. I'm in great need of it, I can tell you. You! cried Ben. I tell you yes, shouted Blackbeard. It is I, myself, that I am talking about. I want to be converted from the evil of my ways, and I have made up my mind that you shall do it. You are a good and a pious man, and it is not often that I get hold of one of that kind, or, if I do, I slice off his head before I discover his quality. I fear me, said the truthful Scotchman, that the job is beyond my ability. Not a bit of it, not a bit of it, shouted the pirate. I am fifty times easier to work upon than that nightcap man of yours, and a hundred times better worth the trouble. I put no trust in that down-faced farmer. When he shouts loudest for the black flag, he is most likely to go into priestly orders, and the better is he reformed, the quicker is he to rob and murder. He is of the kind the devil wants, but it is of no use for any one to show him the way there. He is well able to find it for himself. But it is different with me. "'You canny Scotchman, it is different with me. "'I am an open-handed and open-mouthed scoundrel, "'and I never pretended to be anything else. "'When you begin reforming me, "'you will find your work half done.' "'The Scotchman shook his head. "'I fear me,' he said. "'No, you don't fear yourself,' cried Blackbeard, "'and I won't have it. "'I don't want any of that lazy piety on board my vessel.' If you don't reform me, and do it rightly, I'll slice off both your ears. At this moment a man came aft, carrying a great tankard of mixed drink. Blackbeard took it and held it in his hand. Now then, you bulking chaplain, he cried. Here's a chance for you to begin. What would you have me do? Drain off this great mug and go slashing among my crew? Or hurl it, mug and all? "'Nay, nay,' cried Greenway, "'but rather give half of it to me, "'than will it no disturb your brain, "'and mine will be comforted.' "'Hey, ho!' cried Blackbeard. "'Truly you are a better chaplain than I thought you. "'Drain half this mug, and then, "'by all the powers of heaven and hell, "'you shall convert me. "'Now, look ye,' said the pirate when the mug was empty, and hear what a brave repentance I have already begun. I am tired, my gay gardener, of all these piracies. I have had enough of them. 
Even now my spoils and prizes are greater than I can manage, and why should I strive to make them more? I told you of my young lieutenant, who ran away and who gave his carcass to the birds of prey rather than sail with me and marry my strapping daughter. I liked that fellow, Greenway, and if he had known what was well for him, there might be some reason for me to keep on piling up goods and money, but there's cursed little reason for it now. I have merchandise of value at Belize, and much more of it in these ships, besides money from Charlestown which ought to last an honest gentleman for the rest of his days. Ay, said Ben, but an honest gentleman is sparing of his expenditures. And you think I am not that kind of a man, do you? shouted the pirate. But let me tell you this. I am sailing now for Topsail Inlet, on the North Carolina coast, and I am going to run in there, disperse this fleet, sell my goods, and— Be hanged, interpolated Greenway in surprise. Not a bit of it, you croaking crow, roared the pirate. Not a bit of it. Don't you know, you dullhead, that our good King George has issued a proclamation to the brethren of the coast to come in and behave themselves like honest citizens and receive their pardon? I have done that once, and so I know all about it, but I backslid, showing that my conversion was badly done. It must have been a poor hand that did the job for you, said Greenway, for truly the conversion washed off in the first rain. The pirate laughed a great laugh. The fact is, he said, I did the work myself, and knowing nothing about it made a bad botch of it, but this time it will be different. I'm going to give the matter into your hands, and I shall expect you to do it well. If I become not an honest gentleman this time, you shall pay for it, first with your ears and then with your head. And you're going to keep me by you, said Greenway, with an expression not of the best. Truly so, said Blackbeard. I shall make you my clerk as long as I am a pirate, for I have much writing and figuring work to be done and after that you shall be my chaplain. And whether or not your work will be easier than it is now, it is not for me to say. The Scotchman was about to make an exclamation which might not have been complimentary, but he restrained himself. And Master Bonnet, he asked, if you go a piracy, he may go too, and take the oath. Of course he may, cried the pirate, and of course he shall. I will see to that myself, then I will give him back his ship, for I don't want it, and let him become an honest merchant. "'Give him back his ship!' exclaimed Greenway, his countenance downcast. "'That will be putting into his hands the means of beginning again a life of sin. I pray you don't do that.' Blackbeard leaned back and laughed. I swear that I thought it would be one of the very first steps in conversion for me to give back to the fellow the ship which is his own, and which I have taken from him. But fear not, my noble pirate's clerk. He is not the man that I am. He is a vile coward, and when he has taken the oath he will be afraid to break it. Moreover, and if with that ship, said Greenway, his eyes beginning to sparkle, he becomes an honest merchant. I don't trust him, said Blackbeard. He is a knave and a sharper, and there is no truth in him. But when you have settled up my business, my clerk, and have gotten me well converted, I will send you away with him, and you shall take up again the responsibility of his soul. The Scotchman clapped his horny hands together. And once I get him back to Bridgetown, I will burn his cursed ship. "'Hey, ho!' cried Blackbeard. "'And that will be your way of converting him? "'You know your business, my royal chaplain. "'You know it well.' "'And with that he gave Greenway a tremendous slap on the back, "'which would have dashed to the deck an ordinary man. "'But Ben Greenway was a Scotchman, tough as a yew tree. "'End of chapter 33 Recording by Meg Turasek